But first, the media assets of the Gupta family, the alleged drivers of state capture in South Africa, went under the hammer today. 24 hours earlier, one of the family's close business associates, Mzwaneli Manyi, appeared before the Commission of Inquiry into state capture here in Johannesburg. Last year, the former government spokesperson acquired the Gupta's New Age newspaper and their ANN7 TV station in an opaque vendor financing deal, widely seen as a move to deflect the heat from the Guptas. Now, CNBC Africa reporter Lubabalo Mashitana was at today's fire sale, but before getting into the finer details of the auction, let's have a look at the Gupta family's rapid rise and very slow fall. Once upon a time, a plane took off from India carrying brothers who would write a chapter in African history. It carried the Gupta brothers, Ajay the eldest, Atul and Rajesh, the youngest, often known as Tony. It was 1993 and South Africa was on the cusp of freedom. Their father, back in India, encouraged the brothers to go and set up in the new South Africa, claiming it was going to be an economic powerhouse, a new United States in Africa. On the ground, the brothers started small with a computer assembly and distribution business called Sahara Computers. Their wealth grew and so did their influence. They soon had a very big friend in a very high place, the head of state, President Jacob Zuma. It helped them wield powerful influence that paved the way to lucrative contracts. It was also the key to the ear of those running the country. The brothers worked hard and expanded their operations. They went into mining and made vast acquisitions. JIC Mining Services, Shiva Uranium and Tegeta Exploration and Resources, Optimum Coal Mine and Kuhnfontein Coal Mine. This portfolio diversified to the spoken and written word, the New Age newspaper and ANN7 TV station. The influence was growing and so was the cash. The whole lot generated revenue of $225 million in 2016. But controversy was coming. The whispers about the Gupta influence rose to screams when the family landed a private plane at the restricted military Vatukluf Air Base near Johannesburg. Suddenly, they were on the front pages of all the newspapers. More so because the private plane was not carrying government officials, but merely guests for a Gupta family wedding at nearby Sun City Resort. It all began to go wrong for the Guptas in 2016. Former public protector Tuli Maronsela's State of Capture report sought to unravel alleged improper and unethical conduct by President Jacob Zuma amid his contentious relationship with the Gupta family. With the change of guard in the president's office, it became increasingly uncomfortable for the Guptas in South Africa. It is believed they took off for Dubai, and investigators are on their tail. In recent weeks, the Hawks, South Africa's FBI, swooped on a Gupta-connected project in South Africa's Free State, a multi-million dollar project to help poor people raise cows that didn't really work out. The investigations continue. And let's have a quick look at the auction of the last remnants of the Gupta Empire in South Africa. What have we got for an opening bid to start the ball rolling? Do I have 20 million to start? At 20 million, thank you sir. 21 I've got, 22, any more, 23, any more, 23 million rand I've got to be able to go. The full sound and fury of the auctioneer signifying the end of the Gupta family's media empire in South Africa. The liquidators accepted a 29.5 million rand bid for the building that once strutted the Gupta family's ANN7 television station and housed the New Age newspaper. The winning bidder was part of a consortium that also has aspirations of the building becoming the cornerstone of a new media empire. Nazir Noor Mohammed is the CEO of Niz Media Group. We made an offer, it's subject for them to approve it. But it's on behalf of a consortium, so it's not me alone. We've got a few partners and we put in a bid. Your intentions with the building? First price is for us to start a TV channel, and that's on the ANN side. Uh, I don't know if you know, we've got an existing TV channel called Glow TV, and we want to expand in that direction. So 
So in the studio with me now, I have Lubabalo Mashinkana, who was at the uh, auction today. So just to kick off, just give us a bit of context about the auction of this building that went for 29.5 million rand. Just give us a bit of the background to it. Well, Chris, that building, as you know, used to house uh, the media company NN7, the TV station, and the New Age, the newspaper, which have just closed recently. Well, that building, Chris, initially belonged to uh, the Allen Site Investments 180 company, which is one of the Gupta-linked companies. And that particular company was put under business rescue, and a liquidator was actually appointed to liquidate those assets and that property to pay off creditors. So this money is all going to go to creditors straight? It's all going to go straight to creditors that uh, the company actually owed. So the, the auction wasn't as smooth as many as it appeared to us on TV. What happened there? <laughs> well, Chris, big shots from the media company, I can, from the media space, I can tell you where there, which is one of them is the one that actually bought the company for 29.5 million rand. Uh, the gentleman in question, Chris, uh, actually owns uh, the Glow TV online TV station, which is also an OVHD, and a string of newspapers operating in Tswane. And he actually actually is one of the people who wanted, who bid, who put a bid for ANN7 when it was on sale, when Zwane Lemani bid them into it. And this is man, does, does he have deep enough pockets? Does he have the money a little bit? Who is he? I mean, is he going to, he said he wants to start a TV station from the very same building, but I mean, does he really got it? Well, Chris, uh, the gentleman in question is part of a consortium that actually bought this, which is, um, it's, it's a group, uh, it's, I forgot the name, but it's a group, it's a media group that is quite popular owning the, your Tswane Times, your Centurion Times, all the small newspapers operating in Tswane. And they're not new in the, in the media space. And as I mentioned earlier, that they were bidding for the same, uh, for NN7 earlier this year, when, uh, last year, when Tswane Lemani actually won uh, and bid them into it. And uh, the auction wasn't as smooth as uh, we thought. You said they couldn't find some of the uh, lots that were supposed to be under the hammer. Well, surprisingly, Chris Bishop, the building itself used to house both uh, used to house both those media companies, and the computers were not only from the New Age, but most of the stuff that were the well, that belonged to the TV station were not there. The auctioneer yesterday who was walking us through there said they don't know where those stuff are. What used to be the studio looks like a storage. So there's a controversy somewhere there. Thank you very much, Lubabalo, a witness today to one of the auctions and talking points of the day in business here in South Africa. Coming up after the break, we discuss urbanization. Nearly half of sub-Saharan Africa's population will live in cities by 2030. The question is, what sort of cities will people live in? Welcome back to Capital Connection. I'm Chris Bishop. Now, since the turn of the century, 200 million people have moved from rural areas in Africa to urban areas in sub-Saharan Africa alone. Joining me to discuss the future of African cities and the opportunities therein is in Johannesburg, the senior urban planner at Gibb Engineering and Agriculture, Estelle Orton. And via Skype in Cape Town is Gareth Haysom, a researcher at the University of Cape Town's Africa Centre for Cities. Welcome. Now we're looking at the urbanisation, maybe the wrong way, as a problem to be solved rather than an opportunity to be embraced. But just um, to start off with you, Gareth, in Cape Town, just give us some sort of idea of how fast and how much faster in the years to come this urbanisation is going in sub-Saharan Africa. So thanks, Chris. I think, I mean, for me, this if one maybe a useful way to look at that is to compare Africa's urban state at this point in time with Europe. So the UN's sort of projections for 2020, and it's perhaps the easiest thing to use, is projects about Africa's urban population to be about 580, 590 million people. 
Europe is about, by in 2050, will be about 560 million people. So already Africa is past, from an urban point of view, more urban than Europe might be. But the kicker comes in, I think, when you think of 2050, and that's going to be 1.5 billion people in Africa and only a slightly larger amount, slightly larger growth in, in Europe to about 590, 600 million people. So one and a half billion people living in cities in Africa are, is a rapid move and a rapid transition of society. And I think one of the challenges with this is that this urbanization is taking place without the same jobs that were being created, the same industrial growth that happened as we might understand urbanization which took place in Europe or in the global north. So people are moving to cities without that kind of opportunity of traditional industrial jobs. And, and that poses significant challenges for how infrastructure is funded and a number of other aspects. But I think maybe just the other thing to consider is when we talk of Africa's urbanization, um, we have to think of what types of urbanization is taking place. So whilst Africa might, in, in Africa at the moment, there are about 60 million people living in cities of more than 5 million, but there are 270 million people living in cities of less than 1 million. And so I think one of the things that the evidence shows, and you and Dessa's sort of demographic studies present the same evidence, is that Africa's urban growth is not going to necessarily happen in the Lagos's or the large primary cities. It's in these secondary cities of less than 1 million people where the most significant growth is going to take place. And those cities have less skill, governance, less engineers, less practitioners, their ability to manage fiscal flows is perhaps a little bit more limited. And so that also presents some really interesting challenges. But I think it's those cities where the real opportunities lie for Africa's urban trajectory. Okay, well, we're going to bring you back to the studio here now. Estel Orton of uh, Gibb Engineering and Architecture. Now, you travel the continent. You're on the ground there yes. with these projects, That's which true. I want to talk about in a bit. But one of the big questions that you raise is that urbanization is not keeping pace with infrastructure. Infrastructure is falling far behind. That's correct. Is there money in the infrastructure as well as the, the housing? The, if we're talking about money in infrastructure, um, it is the government that, would that must provide the infrastructure. And I think if we look at how our cities are growing and um, if we just take in terms of what Gareth has said, the informal economy, for instance, is coming into play and that 60% of the urban workforce is em employed in the uh, informal economy. Now that raises an issue for um, municipalities specifically because those, um, the informal economy don't have the income or the investment or even the revenue that's been generated in order to help municipalities to, to generate the revenue for the maintenance and the upkeep and even the provision of new services. So the onus is then on government to, to make provision in their budgets for the provision of um, infrastructure. Um, the provision of infrastructure, I wouldn't say that that is the um, task of the private sector. The private sector need the infrastructure government to provide the infrastructure so that they can do what they do best, and that is economic growth and development and the provision of jobs. And just very briefly, we're going to cross live to Lagos in a second, but uh, you've just returned from Nigeria. That's and correct, yes. what kind of projects are you working on up there? Uh, we currently are part of a transactionary advisory uh, to uh, the Ministry for Airport Cities project. What we are doing is investigating the um, possibility of establishing an aerotropolis in Lagos and Abuja. And that is pretty much focused on providing that infrastructure and creating that investor friendly environment around the airports, which can generate um, the you know, income and public uh, expenditure in, and private uh, expenditure in the long run so that you create that investor friendly environment around the airports. And now we're going to cross to Lagos now and speak to Monachi Akoi, the founder and CEO of real estate investment advisory company, Macor. So just in brief, um, Lagos, the population is increasing, the infrastructure is groaning. How is private money uh, trying to meet the demand and make money at the same time? 
Uh, in, in Lagos, as you've just said, that is very much the case. Um, there are very considerable projections for continuous population increase in Lagos, and the infrastructure, unfortunately, just can't keep up. Um, the Lagos state government does continue to engage with the private sector. Um, they've done so on the Leki Ekbe Expressway, for example, um, where they worked with a company called LCC, and they continue to look for the means by which they can engage the private sector. Of course, the private sector does require some uh, expectations to be able to come into a project. They require, they, they need to be ensure that the sanctity of the contracts is enforceable. And of course, these projects are projects that go on for a long length of time, 10 years, 15 years, 20 years. Uh, changes of governments occur, and the private sector needs to be sure that uh, even with these changes of governments or, or other changes, um, their, their, their funds are secure, their investments are secure. And again, we do have um, issues with the, the stability of the Naira, where these funds are brought in from outside. Again, when you look at the very long terms for infrastructure projects, uh, you have to look for the means by which you can hedge your currency to ensure that you, you, you protect your return. So there are challenges uh, for the private sector coming in to do investments, but Lagos State continues to seek to engage with them and, and to resolve these outstanding issues so that they can join together. Uh, just briefly, I mean, you've got uh, elections coming up there next, early next year in Nigeria. How clear is government policy or otherwise right now when it comes to this problem of urbanization? Urban migration is, um, as we know, as, as, as it has been said uh, a number of times, that the population of Nigeria and population of Lagos is projected to rise very considerably, and particularly in Lagos and in uh, Abuja and in, then in the secondary cities uh, going down. Um, Ideally, the infrastructure and, and the investment and, and areas such as housing would keep up. There are massive deficiencies in housing, for example. Um, the current government has looked to increase investment uh, on roads, again, for example, um, other areas such as refineries, um, the, the fuel that, that all, all these people need, areas that are look, look, being looked into. Um, there, there, there is a very considerable uh, um, gap between the existing requirements for infrastructure and what is currently on ground and the revenue that is being generated by the government can only go so far and that is where the private sector comes in but again there has to be a, a very compelling uh, investment um, basis for the private sector to come in and support the government to do this. Okay, uh, we're well, coming back to studio now and Estelle you've just come back from Nigeria. How, how compelling is that investment case and what kind of projects are you trying to do there on the ground? What we're currently doing on the ground um, is more of, we did an uh, outline business case to determine the feasibility of uh, airport city in Abuja as well as in Lagos. And what we have determined at this stage is that there is indeed a business case for the development around the airport. So what we are basically looking at the moment is creating that environment, creating a spatial framework within which um, this development can take place to give an in indication of what kind of projects should happen when, what kind of infrastructure would be required, what would be the infrastructure demand, should there be first a focus on creating the necessary infrastructure, um, road upgrades, the provision of public transport. But all of that is quite a long process that will still have to happen and it's very much in the beginning of creating that framework within which it can happen. Okay, if we go back to Gareth Hayson uh, at UCT in Cape Town. Gareth, uh, we've talked here about uh, policy and the fact that government should make it very clear and also put an investment case forward for private companies. H how uh, far does that ring true? I, I, think, I think it is something that does certainly have to happen. And I think we, this relationship between the private sector and the state has to play out. So in our work as academics, we've been looking for evidence, and I'll, I've been spending time in some of the secondary cities, as I mentioned, like Kasumu and Lake Victoria or in Kitwe and Zambia. And in our process of research, it's been very active about trying to show city managers what the evidence base might be and work with them to try and identify solutions. We've got projects running in, in, in Ghana at the moment and, and also in, in Dar es Salaam 
around working with city governments, having groups of active, activists, academics, and city officials trying to kind of formulate the, the national urban plans, which is the sort of next 20 year trajectory coming out of the new urban agenda and aligning that to agenda 2063 and the sort of African Union vision of what Africa's future might look like. I think there is this real tension between trying to get policy in place that's secure and stable. And I think many African governments have been pulled in different directions and there's a lot of shifts happening in the global arena at this point in time. But one of the, the imperatives that sit behind this is that the infrastructure that will be put into African cities in the next 20 years will be with Africa for the next 100 years. Um, it, yeah, different types of infrastructure. So the imperative is now, and this is, put, puts an inordinate pressure, I think, on African governments, but also the private sector, to find ways to work through what might at times appear to be intractable kind of differences and problems. We, it's, it's, Africa's future really depends on what we do in terms of infrastructure and how the policy enables that in the next 20 years. I'd say I'm going to come to all of you um, to sort of round up your comments. And also, we're almost in 2019. It's going to be a very challenging year for most economies across the continent. But when it comes to urbanization, if I go back to you um, uh, in Lagos, um, what do you think uh, is going to be happening next year? What, what are the prospects for next year when it comes to this business of urbanization and the private sector and government? Uh, of course, um, early in 2019, we do have the, the um, elections going on. So uh, the, current, uh, the, current, the current government does have a, a policy that they have put in place and they're trying to uh, move forward where they are making additional um, investments, in particular in infrastructure, in transport, in other areas such as agriculture. Um, the question is asked whether they will remain in power or whether somebody else will, will come in power. If they do remain in power, we do expect to see additional revenue going into infrastructure. Of course, infrastructure and transport form the bed bone of the economy, and we do need to improve on both infrastructure, on our road systems, on power uh, in particular, and, and, and other areas, but particularly power, uh, roads, the ports, all these areas need uh, a, a lot of additional capital. Um, even if there is a change in government. We do expect that to remain the case. Um, Nigeria is actually trying to diversify its economy away from oil. And to do this, we do need a, a, a much improved road infrastructure. Unfortunately, we lost um, the contracts with GE recently where they were going to build the rail system up to the north. These are all areas where the government needs to focus on the ports, particularly um, Apapa port is congested. Uh, we need some, uh, a, a lot of additional port capacity. So all these areas are areas where the government does need to invest in, but of course, it's, 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 uh, the question is the revenue required. And again, that brings us back to private sector uh, uh, joint ventures and participation. Uh, just back to here, Estelle Orton in the studio. Very brief, 10, 15 seconds. Where do you see the, uh, the urbanization industry, as it were, going next year? What I basically see is that um, government has got the spatial development frameworks in most of their major cities and it is very important that they stick to their plans because within that it gives a vision and uh, as well as a growth trajectory of where they want to go and as long as they stick to that and keep to that and do their capital expenditure, to expenditure in that, there's, there's hope. Thank you very much. Estelle Orton, Senior Urban Planner, Gear of Engineering Architecture. Thank you very much in Lagos. Munachi Akoi, the founder and CEO of real estate investment advisory firm McCaw. And also in Cape Town, thank you very much to Gareth Hayson, uh, the researcher for the African Centre for Cities in UCT. And I'm afraid that's all we've got time for on this edition of Capital Connection. Thank you to my guests. Join us again every Monday and Wednesdays at 6.30 p.m. CAT. From me, Chris Bishop, it's good night. Mm -hmm.